Uh, Gold Hope Project is a nonprofit. And what they do is they gift pediatric cancer families a free photo session. So I'm a volunteer through that. It's a wonderful organization. So I'm gonna go ahead and then get started and then save a little bit of time at the end to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, just one second while I open this up. Okay, I'm gonna keep the, I think I'm gonna keep the webcam open for now. And if, if for some reason connection isn't good, someone just let me know, say, hey, maybe we need to close it, okay? Yeah, I'll keep an eye on it and see if your Wonderful. audio starts dropping out. Okay, perfect, thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Like I said, we're gonna be talking about children's holiday portraits. And before I get into all of like the, the lighting, the inspiration and stuff that I wanted to just mention my gear, talk about my gear, gear real quick. Most of the slides I list uh, the lens that I use and also some of the sides will include settings as well. And as you can see here, I shoot with two camera bodies, the Sony a7R4 and Canon 5D Mark IV. I love them for, for different reasons. So I wanted to just quick mention why, because I always get these, this question. I love my Sony because of the focusing, the auto eye tracker, all of that, it's amazing. Canon, uh, I love the color. Um, and I also think it operates really well in low light situations. Uh, as you can see, all Sigma Art Prime lenses. Uh, I have quite a few. I love primes because I work in low light a lot. And in my house, I shoot about 95% of my work is in and around my home. So I'm working in a low light situation. I love these primes. I would say my two favorite Sigma Art lenses are the Sigma Art 35 use that heavily indoors. And then the Sigma Art 105 1.4, I use heavily outside. It's a dreamy, dreamy lens. And you're gonna see a lot of these shots were taken with that lens as well. It's a great portrait lens. Um, I am mainly a natural light photographer, but I do shoot with created light. You could see I have like Profoto A10, Profoto B10, several light modifiers that I use, uh, Manfrotto tripod, light stand and tripod arm. And then Peak Design Backpack, which I love. I can fit, I don't know if I have it by me. I don't think I do. Um, I can fit like so much gear and that two camera bodies and about four to five lenses and the bag isn't even that big. It's just, um, I don't know how, how it works, but I'm able to fit a lot of stuff. So I wanna get started and, and first just talk about lighting because obviously it's incredibly important. Um, and so, one of the things I wanted to just kind of highlight is how I use light. I use light to guide the viewer through my frame, to draw attention to certain details and enhance my subject's story. Often I'm working with one light source because um, that's just my preferred light. I like that dramatic light. So in this instance here, it's just one north facing window. So I'm getting some nice soft light coming in. Um, anytime you work with a north facing window, you're always gonna have really soft light. And so uh, nice directional soft light coming in. That's giving my image a lot of contrast, a lot of depth. You could see the highlights and shadows are really strong here. Um, and I'm really paying attention to how that light is falling, what it's highlighting, uh, what I want it to not highlight and all of that. Uh, so one of the tips I have is, is on waiting for good light. Uh, study the light in and around your home throughout the day or your client's home. Um, obviously, it's going to change hour by hour, day by day, and season by season. Um, you know, how the light is in this room here, in, in this image, in the winter is not the same as it is in the summer. It definitely changes. Um, and so I have my favorite rooms that I like to shoot in. And I, I really, truly try to study that. And I write down the times when I notice the good light and I circle back. Um, to, to that good light when I have the time. Um, for, for me, it's, it's writing that down. It's, just, it's a huge, makes a huge difference. I know it's a really simple thing, um, but uh, I'm constantly you know, busy and on the go and I don't always remember things. And I feel like uh, writing these things down um, is a great way to kind of just stay inspired, to stay motivated and um, to circle back when I'm able to like, actually shoot and have the time to, you know, shoot these like conceptual ideas. This is a shot with 
my husband and I, and then my son, as you could see in the mirror, his reflection. And this is actually a, a replication of a Norman Rockwell painting. So what if I want to shoot and the light is poor? And this happens to me a lot. Like maybe, maybe it's, um, a cloudy day, you don't have a lot of light available to you, or maybe um, you know, you're getting direct sunlight in from the window because it's a south facing window and the sun is on that side of the house at that time of day. Uh, there's you know, lots of different things that play a role with natural light, of course. So one of the things I would encourage is to unglue your feet and change perspectives, to move around, uh, making slight shifts, um, and experiment, experiment with that light uh, and then manipulate the light if, if you are able, if you need to. So all the windows in our house, we have curtains on our windows and this is huge. The, the curtains all are typically light filtering curtains. So for example, if the sun is shining through a window and it's really harsh and I want it to be soft and I need to shoot in that room, I wanna shoot in that room. What do I do? All I have to do is close those light filtering curtains and it softens the light. And you can find them anywhere. I, I find them like at our local grocery store, super cheap, like, you know, 15 bucks, um, nothing expensive, nothing fancy, but it does the trick. It softens that light for me and creates kind of like a soft box. So a lot of our windows have that. When I photographed clients, I don't photograph clients anymore just because I don't have the time to do that. But when I did, what I would do is I would bring curtains with me and clamps. And um, I, cause I always found that some clients just didn't have that. So if I needed to soften the light in the window, I could do that just by clamping curtains up in their house. So on manipulating light, one of the things I wanted to mention that it's super, super important is you need to decide before you start shooting, is the environment important to your subject story? And if, the environment is. If you're shooting an environmental portrait and you want to include a lot of the space and a lot of the details in the room, then you may want to consider allowing a lot of light to flood into the room. So opening those windows, allowing a lot of that light to come in. If the environment is not important to your story, if there's some distractions you're trying to hide, then you know you can manipulate the window by using curtains and kind of creating like a pocket of light, dramatic light, as you can see here. Um, so I'm creating directional light through the use of curtains, which is giving, again, my image a lot of contrast, a lot of depth. Um, and of course, the, the closer you place your subject to the window, the more dramatic the light fall off is going to be. So as you can see here, they're very close to the window. There's a dramatic light fall off. We have some deep shadows. Um, and then the, the further you pull them away, the softer the light is going to be. So again, if you really want to highlight some things in the room, um, you may want to consider pulling your subject further away from the window and then that'll soften the light, soften the shadows. Um, and you'll be able to kind of see the details within the room a little bit more. But I get this question a lot about how do I make that dark background? How do I get that like high contrast? And one answer is, is simply just to bring your subject closer to the window, get them closer to the window and you're going to get that nice dark background. So created light. Uh, this is super important. I, I think the, the best tip I could give on this uh, is to use flash uh, the same way you would natural light. I've been using um, like creative light for about four or five years now. I am self-taught and the way I could really grasp and understand creative light was just looking at it kind of the same way that I do natural light, studying the highlights and the shadows. Are there catch lights in my subject's eyes if they're looking at the camera? Um, and then I also like to use modifit fires to manipulate the light, to soften the light if I need to. And sometimes these modifiers are not fancy. They're, you know, I love umbrellas uh, and I use umbrellas a lot to soften the, the light and the flash and the strobe. But uh, sometimes uh, I don't have that available to me. I'm trying to work quickly because I'm working with little kids. So I will hang like a white sheet or something and just soften the light that way. Whatever I have available to me, it doesn't matter. All I care about is, is the light good? Does the light look good? I don't care what modifiers I'm using. Um, I'm just looking at how the highlights are falling, shadows are falling, and if I, I have catch lights in my subject's eyes. 
And again, this is another self-portrait with my husband and I, another Norman Rockwell replication that we did. And this is just a quick like this isn't the actual pullback from the shot here, but it's a very similar, it's the same setup actually, same room. And this is how I would set it up um, Profoto A10 on a tripod with my Profoto large deep white umbrella. And I'm just bouncing the light off that onto us, which is helping to soften the light and make it look like natural light. And I'm using flash here. It was actually, I think midday, but it was low light, it was in the winter, didn't have a lot of natural light available to us. Uh, we weren't that close to the window, so I needed an extra boost of light. So, but this is again, like this is pullback of another setup, but they're the same kind of setup. This is my go-to setup. Um, and as you can see, I even placed the uh, light and umbrella right next to the window there. I don't need to, but um, I just ended up placing it there. And again, it's a tight space. You could see here, it's not a very big room. It's the umbrella is, is right up against that wall. I also mix lighting and I know some people say, don't do that, but I do think there's a right way and a wrong way to maybe do that. Um, you know, what you want to be careful of is watching your subject's skin tone. Um, if you have um, uh, different kinds of light falling on your subject, different temperatures, it can really throw off the white balance in the skin tone. But here, as you could see, it's not really doing that because what's happening is there's a north facing window that's lighting both my daughter and our puppy at the time. It's nice and soft and I slightly underexposed it. And then I've got this really, really warm light kind of backlighting them and giving this them like a glow here. So my Profoto B10 and it's behind this puppet show here. I uh, had, there's a temperature slider on the B10 so you can warm the light up and I had it all the way as warm as it could go. Uh, as you can see here, it's giving this like a, a nice glow. And so I often will mix lighting like this. So I'll use like natural light maybe to kind of highlight my subjects. And then I might use like my B10 um, to kind of create like a warm backlight. So ambient light, also not being afraid to use whatever light you have a, available to you. This is my one of my favorite Christmas shots to get of my kids every single year. And we go to the same storefront um, in town. And I'm lucky here because they they have these like big um, spotlights in the window. So with these lights, they're really, really like strong lighting. And so it's helping to obviously light my sun here, as you can see. And I use a long lens because I like the bokeh that I get uh, from this lens. Um, and sometimes like the street lights behind him and all of that. Um, but I have them really close to the to the window, as you can see. Um, and I actually think my ISO wasn't that high. I think it was probably around 1000, 1250, which is not high at all, really. And it was partly because of that lighting in the window. But having them be really close to the window here also also really helps. And I wanted it more of like a profile shot because this isn't like great portrait lighting. Um, so I felt like having him kind of look up towards the window, just highlighting his profile was going to be the best bet for something like this. I wanted to also talk about uh, Christmas lights, because this is, I think, something that a lot of times people have questions about. It's something I've struggled with over the years. It can be a bit tricky. Uh, so I wanted to include some tips on photographing kids and tree lights. Uh, and there's some tips and tricks that I do that I think help. So first of all, use lots of lights in your tree. So this is a, our Christmas tree and it already comes with lights in it. And then I put more in it. I keep putting more and more and more in. And I also use patio lights. So you could see if you look really closely, there's some really big bulbs. That's because I also string patio lights in there. So my tree is just very well lit. Um, and I've just put tons and tons of strands in, in my tree. And I also place my children very close to the tree here, as you can see. Of course, don't be afraid to crank your ISO, especially in situations like this. But I think my ISO was pretty low here, again, like a thousand or so, but I have a ton of lights in my tree. Um, there's one like little thing that I do as well to help with lighting their faces. I can't really see it, but I actually place like a ball of an extra strand or two right where their faces are. I hide it inside the tree. So I tuck it in. Um, you can't see it 
from from this viewpoint but if you were to kind of go over where they're standing you'd probably see that ball of light but i kind of just tuck it inside the tree it gives an extra boost of light to help light their profiles here uh, so that's another thing that i do i only do it for this shot so don't keep it in there like you know during the holidays but um, for this specific shot i'll tuck it right in there uh, in regards to light in general, how to keep kids engaged in good light. This could be tricky depending on their age. And my daughter, she's a toddler. I think this is like one of the toughest ages to photograph, you know, with them being um, so little. They have a short attention span, obviously. Um, and there's lots of things that I do. So one of the things is, you know, give your subject something to look at something um, to do, like setting up an activity of some sort, um, something that they can play uh, and kind of stay put for a little longer. Center the activity around food. This works for any age. Uh, get in the frame with your child or have a parent or whatever, get in the frame with a child that will, will again, usually keep them engaged longer. Pair your uh, kiddo up with another or a pet would be another option as well. Just somebody to be with. And the last thing is to have fun and play games. And this specific shot is one where it's a game for us. So I will have my daughter lay here. And um, as you know, like with toddlers, the, the attention span is short and should be run, running off in like 30 seconds onto the next thing. What I do, a lot of times I hold something very soft, like a feather or a leaf or a flower or you know whatever. And I'll hold it right next to my lens, shooting from above, photographing her. And I, I'll pretend to drop it. And then sometimes I will drop it, it's nice and soft and it's a game. She gets really excited and I get a lot of expressions. So with me holding that feather, let's say feather, um, next to the lens, she's looking right at the lens then. And she's watching that feather. So I'm getting direct eye contact, which is what I want. And she's giggling, she's laughing, I'll drop the feather, I get lots, like I said, lots of expressions. So it's a, it's a game for us. And this is how I get these types of shots. So on to the power of color. So I really strive for in my work, more of like a painterly approach. Part of how to get like that painterly approach is lighting. Um, and as you could see, I would say like a lot of the light that I'm drawn to is like Dutch master's light, that very like dramatic lighting. The other way to get that sort of like painterly look is also just being intentional with your color palette, just like painters would be. Uh, and I, I love to do this. I love to be intentional with my color palettes if I'm able to. Um, the power of color, you can help guide your viewer through your frame. It can create balance as well in your image. It can isolate your subject, make them pop. And of course it can also add symbolism and meaning. And here I was really intentional with color and having repetition of color. And I do you know, alter some things in post-processing a little bit too, not dramatically, but I might enhance the colors a little bit in, in both Lightroom and Photoshop if I need to. And I think in this shot here, I actually made her bonnet kind of match his um, snowsuit a little more. I think her bonnet was actually a little bit more red and I made it more brown, uh, which was easy to do because the colors are similar. So it wasn't much tweaking really. So power of color, guiding the, the viewer through your frame. This is an indoor shot. Um, of my daughter in her room. This is just taken at her window. Uh, I was just getting experimental with perspectives here. I shot this with my Sigma Art 24 millimeter, but you can see the repetition of blues going on. There's like these blue snowflakes on the window that lead right to her and she's dressed in blue. That was all intentional and pre-planned. So it wasn't just by accident that I did this here. It can also, of course, with color, add balance to your frame. And that's something I, I, I feel like I'm constantly paying attention to. Is my image well balanced or is it like heavy on one side or the other? Like I, I'm constantly paying attention to that and try to add repetition of color and, and splashes of color, visual echoes basically throughout my frame. And as you can see there here, there's lots of repetition of reds, of course. So again, on balance, now here it's a little bit more subtle, but one of the things that was very intentional with 
is uh, like you can see here on the left side included the curtains here are these cream curtains and then my daughter and I are wearing cream on the right and that was again very intentional adding kind of balance to my frame here with kind of diagonal line and composition um, but that that repetition of that color on the left and then on the right really adds balance to my frame another example of balance as well here and this is with my daughter uh, this is a shot i've gotten at least with my last two kiddos making ornaments for christmas and so i'm just putting her little foot here in, in the ornament um, this is obviously shot from above and you could see the repetition of like the teal well i guess it's not teal it's more like a like an aqua but on the left side and then the right side here that balance um, that i have going on um, again, is, is very intentional. It's just supposed to guide the viewer through the frame. Um, but I do want to quick mention about this shot as well, because I get questions on, on some of these images as far as like how I'm shooting from above. Um, I mentioned the very beginning of my gear that I have a Manfrotto tripod, a Manfrotto light stand, and a Manfrotto tripod arm. What I use is my Manfrotto light stand, which goes up 12 feet. So it goes up very high. And then the tripod arm. So it goes like, like it's like a T. And I'm able to shoot downward using that, which is really handy, really nice. Um, sometimes I use my interval timer. I pre-focus and use my interval interval timer, excuse me. Sometimes I, I like to just use my uh, Canon Connect app on my phone because I can focus uh, and then shoot with that, which is really handy. I usually just have like the timer on. So like when I focus and then go to shoot with that on, um, I'm able to like have that 10 second timer so I can hide the phone to get the shot. So I just wanted to quick explain that. That's one of the ways I get these like above shots is with that tripod arm. So on isolating your subject too, this is another wonderful thing you could do with color, make your subject pop. And again, I'm very intentional with this. If I know we're gonna be, for example, in an area where there's a lot of green. Chances are I'm actually probably not gonna dress my, my daughter in green. I'm gonna probably dress her in something that's gonna make her pop. Red is a complementary color to green, um, you know, or, or something of the sort that's gonna really make her pop and stand out and isolate her. Another, you know, example here where subjects are isolated with these color pops, um, again, very intentional with my color palette. They're mailing out their Santa letters. This is another shot that I get every single year. And I made it a point to at least see a couple of their letters, um, as you can see here on there. So just for better storytelling, basically. I was very intentional with the, that detail, but this is just our mailbox. Um, but I try to wait on for a day when we have snow, when it's snowing to, to get this shot. Um, and then we'd line them all up <laughs> and get them mailing their letters. But this is one of my favorite traditional shots to get. Um, and again, using my 105 for that like dreamy compression and to, to isolate them and make them pop too a little more. Again, on isolating subject, making them pop with that, that color pop here. You can see the red scarf that she's wearing. We were just walking to our car <laughs> at home in the winter. Um, and it was not very fun, but uh, we did this quick, got this quick shot of her. Um, we often have to bundle even just to walk to our car in the winter here. But I did love the scarf movement and, and the color pop from what she was wearing. Uh, as the other thing that, you know, color of course can do is add symbolism, symbolism and meaning. Obviously colors have meaning. And so um, being intentional about that too as well can really strengthen storytelling within your work, make your images, um, you know, stand out a little bit more, um, you know, paying attention to complementary colors as well. Complementary colors are colors that are opposite of each other in the color wheel. Then you've got analogous colors. And I don't feel like those are talked about as much. And I love analogous colors. Analogous colors are colors that are next to each other in the color wheel. So an example would be yellow, green, and blue would be analogous colors. Um, they work really well together. Uh, typically with analogous colors, you would have about three or more um, included within your frame. But I think that's part of the fun and part of the joy of this is for me, picking out that color palette, planning out that process. And no, I don't always pre-plan you know, all my shots. Um, 
I try to have like a healthy balance of like conceptual ideas and candid with my kids. But I do get so much joy out of doing a lot of these like uh, conceptual ideas and, and pre-planned shots like this and portraits. So I wanted to talk about inspiration. Where do I get my inspiration? And there are lots of different places. I would say one of the number one places I get insp inspiration from is honestly just daily life, routine moments with my kids. Um, I wanna talk about you know conceptual ideas, uh, traditions and nostalgia play a very big part in, in my work um, and personal projects. As you can see here an example, I look to art quite often um, for ideas. Um, and so this is an example where I saw this old vintage magazine cover, I loved it. And I kind of pulled really the, the color palette and the idea from this one, really loved the color palette. And I happened to have this clothing already. And um, I did this shot with my daughter. And again, as you can see, I gave her something to do. Um, I'm having her help me wrap. And so she was able to stay engaged longer uh, with me here. And I was able to keep her in, in good light for a longer period of time. So conceptual ideas, some of the places I, I look to for inspiration, not only are just like classic art like that, um, vintage magazines and stuff, but uh, films. So I hope everybody knows this film, but if you don't, it's a Christmas story. It's a classic. It's one of the best. <laughs> I absolutely love it. And I get this shot every year. So this was last year and this is the year before. He does this expression so well. Um, and I think I got this like pink nightmare bunny suit off Amazon. Um, but the rest of the stuff in the frame here is, is stuff that we've had, we have in our house, my grandpa's old radio and everything. I wanted to include that because of the movie. Um, but this is one of my favorite Christmas shots to get every single year with my kids. This one is actually from Scrooge. So I pulled this inspiration idea from Scrooge. And, um, if you remember in the movie with Bill Murray, there's a part where there's a little boy where they dress him up as a Christmas tree. And I love that idea. And so I took that idea, kind of ran with it here. And this is actually a collab with a children's store. They had all these like really cute ornaments and they needed this shot like super early in the fall. So we didn't have our tree up at the time. So I was like, well, I'll make her tree. And I kind of pulled that idea from that movie um, here. So I had my son kind of like pretending to hang ornaments on her. And she got, kind of gave me this awesome deadpan stare which is what I really wanted. Um, for this shot and it ended up being one of my favorite Christmas shots of my kids um, but I pulled that original idea from from that movie Scrooge. Uh, more on conceptual ideas again looking to classic art and just art in general and there's so many different art forms you can look at just like not only films and, and paintings and illustrations and old magazines but you can look at music too that would be another um, route to take as well. I love Norman Rockwell. I've been doing like a personal project for about three or four years. I think it's been about four years, longer than that even maybe, um, where I replicate his work. And so I uh, pick some of my favorite illustrations and paintings of his and replicate that. And this is a very famous one of his um, that I replicated. And one of my more favorite like Christmas shots with my son, he was perfect for this. Um, and I kind of added my own twist to it. So this is the original, as you could see. Uh, and the color scheme is a little bit different. I kind of stayed true to my own voice and my style here with the more like darker, moodier kind of tones uh, and dramatic lighting. Um, but the idea, I definitely took that idea. I love that idea and, and ran with it here. This is another example, again, with my husband and I. These are really fun to do. I, we, my husband and I have a lot of fun with these. We usually do them during Christmas time. And he's a good sport. Um, and this is the original here. As you could see, again, I kind of stay true to my voice with the colors. Um, I'm picking a color palette, kind of laying these things all out. Um, so I, I kind of ran with the idea, but then uh, picked out my own personal colors that I preferred and wanted. So, and these are all shot with uh, my Sigma Art 35 millimeter, which is, like I said, my go-to lens, especially when I'm shooting indoors. Now, this one is a little bit different. This one is, the, it's the original by Norman Rock, Rockwell here. And I loved it. But one of the things I really wanted was to actually see a, don't see that. 
Um, and that's fine, but I really wanted to add that in and kind of make it my own. And we are a military family. My husband serves in the military. So, um, and he has for about 15 years now. And so he is away a lot and uh, it's important to our story. So I added him in here, like he's coming home um, and just had him kind of waving to us. One of the things I love about this shot is my daughter. <laughs> never know what you're going to get. You never know what they're going to do. And there's just so authentic and real. And she just smushed her face right up against the window. And I feel like it made this shot, but you could see the colors are different. I didn't stick with the same colors and then changed it a little bit to kind of make it my own. I think that's the fun thing about shots like this. Uh, another Norman Rockwell, and this is the original, as you can see here, again, just changing up the colors a little uh, flash here. Um, similar setup to what I showed you guys before earlier in this presentation with the light stand and the umbrella um, here. But uh, this worked out really well. I was actually surprised it did because I'm working again with a toddler. I knew my son would be able to take like gentle direction, but my daughter, she, you know, I just had her, I couldn't really get her to pretend to sleep so much. Um, so I just kind of ran with whatever she would do here. And I was like, okay, can you try Can you try to sleep? Can you try to hide your face? And so that's what she ended up doing here and it works. I like it. So, um, more on conceptual ideas, just looking to like old vintage things like Saturday evening posts. There's a lot of great Christmas ideas. If you look at like the Saturday evening post. Um, and I just, I love this. I like pose here with the little kid going through their stocking. So I had my daughter doing that here. And this was also a collab for a children's store. A couple of them, actually. I do work with um, some children's brands. So this had to be shot for that. Um, but you could see, again, changed up the colors and all of that. So another place that I get inspiration is traditions. Um, I look to traditions uh, for ideas. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a shot I get every single year. As you can see here, I've got it with all of my kids. Whoa, sorry, I don't know what just happened there. My <laughs> presentation went crazy. But as you could see, um, again, I'm shooting that every single shot was with my Sigma Art 105 because I just love the bokeh that I get from that lens. It really, I think, makes this even more dreamy and magical. Again, you could see they're all profile shots. Uh, my daughter's very close to the window here. You can see my son's close to the window here. Um, and one of the things that I do, and I highly encourage you guys to do is write a list, write a, I always, I just wrote my Christmas list, like shooting list, uh, about a week ago. Um, and I'm already starting to look at it and starting to shoot some of it now because I really enjoy it and everything, but, um, it really helps me stay inspired that way. So I'm writing a list of all that kind of stuff. Um, more on traditions here. This is another Norman Rockwell replication. Um, he has very famous four paintings called the Four Freedoms, and this is one of them. Uh, this was taken at Thanksgiving. It's a shot I always wanted to do. It was a bit tricky, obviously, because of um, several things, lighting and then also setting. Um, I, this is created light here. I'm using flash, uh, and I obviously needed to have a very uh, narrow aperture here. The two kiddos closest to the camera, they're not, they're not completely in focus and that's okay. They're a little bit soft, but not by much. And I'm okay with that because my husband and I are the main focus here. Um, but I definitely was intentional with having a very narrow aperture to make sure you could see all of us very clearly uh, and as much as possible. Again, very intentional with my color palette as you could see here too as well. But I had to be very quick with this shot because the food was actually hot and nobody wanted to wait. So I had everything ready to go, everything. I had my test shot, everything. And um, before the food was ready and everybody had sat down. Um, and I, one other tip I wanted to just mention on this, it can be tricky photographing so many people in the frame like, like I, I have here. And this, none of this is a composite at all. Um, the first few shots, everybody was very stiff and kind of like not very expressive or anything seemed really posed. And how I got everybody to relax was I ended up having the boys start singing to my daughter. 
I had them sing the ABCs. So they're all kind of talking here and relaxing, which is kind of what I wanted. That's, I wanted that candid moment. My daughter's like smiling, although you can't really see it, but you could see by her body language that she is. Uh, and it helped everybody relax. And then this ended up being my favorite shot just by getting them to sing. Uh, more on traditions here, as you can see, um, we always go on the Santa train every Christmas. And so I like to get this shot. And here's the trick with that. If you have places like this that are end up getting really busy, like if you have a tradition that you do and it's very busy, like Christmas tree farm or whatever, try to go at a time when there's not a lot of people. So um, I shot this early in the morning before the Santa train even opened. So there was nobody there. Uh, which was nice. It was very calming for both me and my daughter, everybody in the family, uh, because we didn't have to worry about all these people um, and worrying about, you know, me having to try to Photoshop people out of the frame. So I went early in the morning to get this before we rode the Santa train. And here, here it is again. So I'm getting the shot every year and I'm having them look up to have like nice light on their face, face as you can see here. Uh, this is probably my favorite shot out of all the train shots that I've gotten just because um, it ended up snowing and it was like perfect timing. We were lucky. We were very lucky. We were riding the train. We got off the train and it, it had started to snow and I got this shot and I absolutely love it of my son when he was really young, but we've been on doing this train ride, Santa train for probably like eight years now. Um, so a, a very long time. And here's a shot inside the train as well. He's very close to the window. So there's nice light falling on his profile here, as you can see. Um, and I've added a little bit of magic. This isn't normally something that I do with like overlays very often, except during the holidays. <laughs> so I feel like that's the time that you can get away with it. So I'll add a little bit of like magic and dust and sparkle sometimes to some of my images, just to kind of give it an extra something. So, sorry, I don't know why this keeps doing this. It keeps like going crazy on me here, but more on traditions. I feel like this you know, like this shot that you have to get like every Christmas with your kids. Again, it can be tricky. Um, this one really worked out well because it is a really pretty setting. Um, and I was able to get like all of my kids here in the frame. Uh, but again, settings play a really, really big role in shots like this. You wanna be careful about your aperture, uh, making sure that it's not too wide, um, that you have an aperture that's narrow enough to get everybody in focus is super important. So that's something that I am very intentional with and paying attention to. Um, uh, this is another traditional shot that I love to get, um, the place that we go to every Christmas with my boys. And again, as you can see, I've given them something to do. They have hot cocoa here. And so uh, this ended up being one of my like favorite storytelling images just because my youngest son, you can see he's a little bit upset. It's because he spilled his hot cocoa here. And I just loved like their expressions that they gave me in this shot. Uh, and what they were doing. But I'm able to kind of get these like authentic expressions from my kids just by giving them something, whether it's food or, you know, giving them something to do. So along the lines of traditions, I wanted to talk about nostalgia because it plays, again, like I said, a very big role in my work. Um, the things that I love to do as a child, I love to do with my kids and to photograph that as well. So I used to make you know, a garland, a Christmas garland like this with my mom every single year. I was always in charge of making that to hang it on the tree. And so I always like to create like a little flat lay, something like, like this here, um, attentional with the colors and all of that. And then photograph my daughter kind of just eating all the food, not actually making stuff. <laughs> she's too, she's too young to obviously be holding a needle and all that. So, um, I like to get these, these kind of shots and I, I really like look to nostalgia for ideas and inspiration, you know, the tree farm, the kids all pick out like a small tree for their bedrooms. Every Christmas we let them pick out a little tree. And so here they are with their, their trees and I get the shot and it's a fairly easy shot too, because they're looking away. So I don't have to worry about expressions. Um, again, I'm being intentional with the color palettes as well. The color palette here and the, the splashes of, like burnt orange and green and all of that. So again, another shot from the Christmas tree farm and using like framing and layers to add depth to my images. Um, and I even wanna just quick mention the lighting situation. Again, I, you've seen probably a lot of photos where I have my kids like looking up 
on overcast days like this, this is a great thing to kind of have them, of course, look up a little bit more to allow for like nicer light to fall on their profiles and on their faces. Um, when you have lighting that isn't like necessarily sometimes ideal, and I might be a little bit flat. So if you have that flat lighting, having them look up is going to give you a little bit more contrast and depth in your images. So I just had her look up at the tree, talk about the tree here and was able to get this shot. Um, more on nostalgia, just like that first snowfall, capturing that first snowfall. And here's two different shots that I got, one closer up, obviously, and then one further away, both shot with a 105. This is definitely my favorite lens to use in inclement weather. So when it's snowing or raining, I'm using this lens. And the reason is, it's because of the bokeh. Look at that bokeh, it's just amazing. It really makes that pop. And of course, settings also play a role. I'm shooting with a wide aperture here of like 1.8, 1.6. So it really makes that, that snowfall pop even more. And this is another shot from the first snowfall. So, um, you know, being intentional too about like different ways to shoot things, I think is really important. There's so many different ways and creative ways to, to shoot things. And so, yeah, we're getting outside and shooting that first snowfall, snowfall outside, but then maybe one of the things you can do is photograph your kiddo, you know, looking outside at the snow through the window and shooting from the outside in. So getting outside and shooting through that window to photograph some fun expressions and, you know, see that, that first snowfall from a different perspective. Personal projects as well are um, a great like motivator for me. Uh, I have lots of different that I do throughout the year and I usually set new goals every new year but I love to bake I do a lot of these like flat lays and then add my kiddo in the frame and kind of just let them have at it um and of course I get a lot of kids they're eating something sweet that they really enjoy um one of the things I wanted to just mention is with these I actually typically shoot the flat lay first and get my safe shot first and then bring my kiddo into the frame so if they destroy the flat lay, I have a shot where the flat lay has not been destroyed. <laughs> so I have both those options. So that is one thing I do just to be safe. Um, Cause I just like them to kind of have at it and do whatever they wanna do um, in regards to like cookies like this and stuff and sweets. So more on personal projects, like I, like I shared earlier, you know, shooting through the window. I love to shoot from the outside in, shooting through screen doors, shooting through windows. Um, as you can see here on the window, I've actually added some like frost, you, like you can buy like frost spray from like right off Amazon actually. And I spray it on my window and it kind of creates like a cool effect, like icicles and, and frost. And so um, that's one of the things I did here is I sprayed this on my window. And you also see there's like snow on the trees behind me. There's some pine trees that we have directly behind me and you can kind of see the reflection. Um, so I think that kind of like added to the magical feel of this as well. Um, but she's popping here. She's popping right in this window pane because I'm actually standing right in front of her. I create kind of like this dark reflection on the window kind of making her pop a little bit more and making her stand out a little bit more. So that's why she's kind of popping so well here is because of where I'm like standing and kind of squatting to photograph her. So just a few more slides, guys, and then I'm gonna answer any questions you might have just as a reminder. So I wanted to real quick, and I think lastly, touch on like creativity. And then I, and then I also have some slides on long lens versus uh, wide angle lens. Um, but I do try to get creative. Uh, this is a, a multiple ex exposure. I think I, these are like probably three or four shots. And I shot and photographed my daughter sleeping in her crib. And then I photographed Christmas lights. Um, I actually just kind of created like a little rectangle on my wall and photographed Christmas lights and layered them on top of each other in camera. With Canon, it's really uh, pretty easy to do. I know it depends on the camera, you use camera band, but um, I was able to just do this all in camera, layering these images together right in camera. I do this every year, as you can see here, um, again, like three or four shots to get this. Um, but it's just something kind of fun to do that, that I enjoy. Um, again, with creativity too, I just 
mentioned this briefly, but, but thinking outside the box, ungluing your feet, moving around, there's so many ways that you can shoot one window. Um, if you're photographing your, your subject um, near a window, you know, get your safe shot first. I always recommend that and then get experimental. Shoot from above, shoot from outside in, uh, shoot like a backlit situation. Just think about the different ways that you can go about like shooting that same situation. I guarantee you'll end up loving some of like the, the images like your second or third or fourth, even more than your first. That's usually what always happens to me. So again, creativity, kind of thinking outside the box, shooting from above. I showed this image earlier, but um, and this was shot with my wide angle, my 24. Almost all my above shots are with my 24, just because it's, you know, I'm able to include a lot of the environment with this type of lens, um, which is what I like. So the last thing I wanna talk about is lens choice. Why is lens choice um, important? I shoot with primes. So I have to be very intentional about what I pack with me if I'm out and about. I always have like a wide angle with me and a telephoto like long lens with me. Um, and the reason I love telephoto lenses, I love telephoto lenses because of the shallow depth of field that you get, how it isolates your subject, how it minimizes distractions. If you've got some distractions in the background, you can easily mask those. It obviously creates a very dreamy atmosphere and large bokeh as well, it really makes things magical. As you can see here, this was with my 135. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted a lens like this to begin with, to, sh to shoot my boys, you know, coming down the hill, sledding down the hill, I was able to be at a good distance away from them so that I could roll out of the way because I was literally laying on the ground right directly in their path. And so I'm actually quite a ways away from them here. It just doesn't look like it because I have that long lens on. But again, it's always, you know, creating such a, a dreamy atmosphere. It's great portrait lens. You can see the beautiful bokeh that I'm getting here behind my daughter in the background. With wide angle lenses, they're great for environmental portraiture. They work wonderful in confined spaces. Um, they're wonderful storytelling lenses as well. As I mentioned earlier, bird's eye view, I use almost, or almost all my shots here that I've shared from above are with the 24. Um, so wide angles are great for that. Um, they have a greater depth of field and they're versatile. They're very versatile. Like if, if I had to just grab one lens, I would have probably always, always grab my 35 because I know it's going to work in just about every single situation. And so again, I'm shooting from above using my 24 here. I'm able to include a lot of the environment. All my like flat lays with my daughter here are shot with wide angle as well. It's just so much easier to, to work with when I have a lens like this on. So, and this is another example here too, when my daughter was really little and taking sink baths, she still takes sink, sink baths, but she's older now and not something I care to share as much, but um, you can see I'm just able to include a lot of that environment. So it's just a wonderful storytelling lens, especially when I'm working in cramped spaces. So I hope you enjoyed like a lot of the inspiration and ideas that I had. Um, I know I shared a lot about like lighting and color theory as well, um, but I, I do want to open it up. I think we've got some time here for some questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Meg. Yeah, you did a, an excellent job of answering most of those questions <laughs> before we even got to this point, but there were a few. Uh, so we'll go ahead sure. and just kind of work our way through those. Um, so a lot of your images have either a really low key um, palette or you're shooting in really high contrast situations like out in snow. Uh, do you find that you have to use a different metering mode for those situations or do you just uh, adjust your settings? Um, I always spot meter, um, so I never change that. Um, and I just adjust my settings. I always try to meter off my hand, actually, as long as my hand is in the same light as my, my subject, as my kiddos. Um, so I find that it's easier just to meter off my hand than trying to meter off of a toddler who's running around. <laughs> so that's how I'm setting my exposure in almost every situation. And I use uh, Kelvin to set my white balance as well. Um, so I am a very, uh, while some of my images look slightly underexposed, um, they're almost all shot with proper exposure and proper white balance. Um, I, I like to have just perfect exposure, perfect white balance if possible just for accurate color, easier editing, perfect, you know, skin tone and all of that. And then I might play with that a little bit in post. 
Gotcha. Awesome. Uh, we also had quite a few people interested in hearing more about how you get some of those overhead shots. I know you mentioned uh, you use a Manfrotto light stand, a boom arm. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any specifics on those models, that would be great. But also, um, do you find that you use that setup all the time when you shoot overhead or do you sometimes try to just do it handheld or from a tripod or do you kind of know when you need to employ mm -hmm. that equipment? Um, I almost always use that setup. Um, I, it just is easier, um, especially I think the more you do it, the, the easier it gets. Um, I don't have the model numbers, um, but uh, I, like I said, I do use, I don't use a, I have a Manfrotto tripod, but I use the Manfrotto light stand. And then I attach my Manfrotto tripod arm to it. And here's the thing, the higher the, the arm, uh, the more unstable can kind of start to get. So sometimes I need to put like a weight, an extra weight on the other side. You know, my camera's on one side and then I might need to put a weight on the other just so that it doesn't ever tip over or anything like that to be safe. I can't say enough about whatever camera body you do use. I know like the, the Canon Connect app, it, it works wonders when I need to focus. Um, so if I'm shooting from above, I'm holding my daughter, um, I'm able to see my, my frame from my phone and focus. And I had that 10 second timer on so I could hide my phone real quick um, and then get the shots and, you know, easy peasy. So um, I, I highly recommend, you know, using something like that if you're able to for focusing and everything. Awesome. And uh, for anyone else out there still wondering more on the specifics of that equipment, uh, the Kenmore camera sales staff would be happy to walk you through some of the model options if you want to either come in the store if you're around or give us a call. Um, kind of still on that note, uh, some of those shots you are shooting through objects like snowflakes. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you get those scenes set up so that you have, I mean, it looks like you're probably in the middle of some of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So um, look at the snowflake scene. This is a perfect example. What I typically do is I have a chair or like a step ladder that I'm standing on and I have my Sigma Art 24. So I'm able to, again, include a lot of the environment and uh, I don't have to get up that high when I have 24 on. Um, so I'm standing on, like I said, a step stool or something. I have my camera in live view. So I think that's the other part of it that I may not have mentioned that's actually really important is I have it in live view and I'm holding it out away from me shooting blindly. I know some cameras you can flip the screen so you could actually see the screen. Um, I always find that hard and confusing. I have my Sony does that, but I like get so confused whenever <laughs> I flip the screen the other way. Um, so I like to just shoot blindly and my camera does a great job, job of, of grabbing focus with the auto eye tracker. And so I just hold it out away from me. Um, and and shoot having my camera in live view um, to get the shot. And usually I, I hold it out in front of me, but I don't hold it like above my head. I kind of hold it out like a little bit below so I can still kind of see my screen um, if that helps. Sometimes I do have to Photoshop like chair legs out or like this, the stool out, but it's only like by a little bit that I have to do that. And it's usually a pretty easy cloning job in Photoshop. That kind of ties into another question we've got. Um, sure. Do you find that you spend much time in post-production getting the, the kind of the atmosphere or the mood of your images dialed in or do you um, primarily get that done in camera? It depends. I love to do as much as possible in camera, but um, sometimes like, cause I would say conceptual ideas, I probably spend the most amount of time on all across the board from the planning process. Cause I'll, I'll start the process of like, planning, I'll draw out my frame. I'll like physically draw it, plan the colors, all of that. And then editing, if I, if it's the composite, it's going to take a little bit. Uh, a lot of my composites are pre-planned. So if I know I'm going to be doing a composite, I'm going to use a tripod uh, so that the composite is 20 million times easier when I'm merging images together in Photoshop and stuff. So composites and stuff like that, conceptual ideas, they could take a good like half hour to an hour. I would say an hour would be a standard editing time which is a long time. But if an image is worth like very important to me, that's, that's worth the time. And I, I enjoy it. I enjoy editing. Um, but at everyday image, um, sometimes it takes like 10 minutes to edit. So not very long. Um, it just, it truly depends on the, the image, but I would say my conceptual ideas take the longest. That makes sense. Uh, let's see. So we've got another question here kind of on the more, um, 
inspirational side. Uh, when you were yeah. getting into this, uh, how did you find, or how did you get into understanding how to see and modify uh, the lighting side of it? So that's something that I know a lot of people often struggle with, um, just understanding how to implement well to get that creative. Right. Well, I can't say enough about just all, like education. So like taking classes and um, I worked really hard um, to, you know, get to where I get am at and still trying to get to <laughs> that makes sense. I'm still taking classes. Um, I think it's really important to to do that to continue to grow. I love to get CC from other photographers as well, like them to rip apart my work, telling them what, you know, I want them to tell me what they think I could do better because um, for me, like obviously my work is very personal to me and it's of my family. And sometimes I don't see things that other people see. Um, and so uh, I was taking classes. I, I started with the basics, understanding my camera. Um, I actually originally started with photography a long time ago. I, I started with film when I was really young. Um, but when I started having children, I really wanted to understand my camera more. And so I was taking classes on understanding manual. I was taking classes on light. Um, I took uh, classes through Click Photo School and I teach through Click Photo School. So that's um, where I, I continue to like take education and stuff like that. Um, so that's really where and how I learned. Um, and then studying like art and studying other photographers work and studying, studying the light that way. I think a big part of it too, is literally just slowing down to like, uh, and, and test out the light and study it. Um, I used to use dolls too. I would just set dolls and like, um, when I, especially when I did newborn photography and I would set dolls in like poses and stuff like that and study how the light was falling on them and do test shots that way. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, so the rest of the questions we have at the moment are more uh, gear focused. So if there's any other questions, um, now would be a great time to post them up before we start winding down. Uh, but I'll just start walking through some of these. Uh, we had some questions. I know you mentioned you use a 5D4 and the Sony A7R4. Are those your two primary yeah. cameras? Do you use any other models? Mm -hmm. nope, those are my two primary. Um, my 5D Mark IV is on its way out though. So I am considering getting the R6. Um, I just, I need to like try it out first. I'm one of those people that wants to try the camera first before I buy it. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is my next step. <laughs> um, another comment about some lens choices. Uh, we noticed that you use the 105 quite a bit. Um, yeah. Is there a reason you prefer that over say like the 85 or the 135? Mm -hmm. uh, I love the 85 a lot too. I have to say that um, I think that's like a great everyday telephoto lens. Um, the reason I love the 105 is just because while it's, it's big and it's heavy, um, it is incredibly sharp, probably the sharpest lens that I own. And I shoot like wide open with it all the time, 1.4, 1.6. And it is the dreamiest lens that I own too, as well, as far as like creating that beautiful compression in the bokeh. Um, so that's why I gravitate towards, I have the 135, but once I got the 105, I tended to just use that more. I know it's a personal preference too, because some people really prefer the 135, but, um, I love that 105 length. And I always have, actually, I have for years and years, I used to have the 105 2.8, um, Sigma lens. And I used to use that all the time to photograph my kids. Um, so I just like that lens length too. So. Yeah. Sometimes things just click, right? <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah. Do you ever use any filters in your photography? No, no, I don't. I'm, I think I'm pretty minimal too with um, just everything that I'm using or, you know, whatever with my kids too. I think um, photographing them, they're so little. I just don't feel like um, I have a lot of time to put things on my lenses or anything like that. So I'm usually really quick and I don't use filters or anything like that on my, on my camera or on my lenses. Okay, and then the last one that I have for you, um, and I know you mentioned, I think you said a peak design bag you kind of tend to use. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Do you remember what model that was? Is it the backpack or? It is a backpack. I don't <laughs> Might be, like, I think it's like their everyday. <laughs> yes, it is. It is their everyday, okay. actually. Thank you for mentioning that because like, I'm exactly. terrible with it. Yeah, it's, I love that bag. Um, I just got it. I've had it for about a year. I have like the gray, um, Peak design, yeah, it's the everyday. And I, like I said, I can fit so much gear in that. And I am more of like a practical person when it comes to bags. 
Like I don't like the side strap or whatever, just because it hurts my shoulders. I like to have like the backpack, the padded straps. So um, we do a lot of hiking too. So uh, I can fit like four or five Sigma lenses and two camera bodies in that thing. It's amazing. Plenty to get it covered, right? <laughs> Yep. <laughs> uh, we have one more that came in. Uh, you mentioned when we were talking about um, measuring the light in your scenes that you use, uh, you tend to use your hand instead of trying to um, use your model. Do you do that um, when you have more of an environmental shot where there's more of the scene? Um, or is that only when you're shooting in closer proximity to a subject? Environmental shots too. Um, if I know exactly where I'm going to have my subject stand, then that's where I'm going to put my hand just to make sure that um, First of all, I have exposure right on, on my daughter, especially too, because I'm working with younger kids. I need to have my settings like ready to go. Um, I, they're not going to sit there and wait for me to figure that out. So um, I get all that done and then, um, you know, make sure that I like how my my background looks and everything. If I want it to be dark, um, obviously, I'm going to have my daughter close to the window. If I want the, the background um, and environment to be lighter and you could see more details, then I'm going to pull her away from the window a little bit more. So. Uh, just do that, do that basically is all. Nice. Okay. Well, I think that about wraps it up for the questions. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for providing all that information. And uh, yeah, a big thank you to Kenmore Camera for hosting us.